Hey everyone, welcome in to a, another daily editorial here on the KE Report. We're chatting with Byron King. We're going to be talking about the correction we are seeing in gold and silver to start this week. We're also going to get into some of the precious metals equities in terms of what Byron is seeing, what stocks are moving, which ones are outperforming, and maybe what areas are still lagging, which I know we can point to some of the smaller stocks in the precious metals sector there. Byron. King is a geologist who writes with the Paradigm Group that was formerly Agora Financial, writes alongside Jim Rickards. Byron, let's start off with the precious metals. Gold price is down about $72 today. Silver price is down a little over $1.50. That's a 3% move for gold and a almost 5.5% move for silver lower. But you take a look at a longer term chart or really just any chart that has shown the run that gold and silver have had just in the last almost two months, this is not a huge move. So I know the question being how much lower, how much how much more of a correction could we go through? But first and foremost, yes, some weakness, maybe natural pullback. Byron, how are you viewing this correction today to kick off the week, please? Well, it's great to be with you. And yes, uh, the term natural pullback seems to make sense to me. Uh, I would say, you know, uh, three months ago in, in the middle of February, when silver was, say, 22 bucks, 20, 2250, if somebody had said to you, yeah, boy, silver's going to go to 2650 or 27, you'd have said, wow, that's great. But what are, what are you smoking? But, you know, but here we are, except we, we made it to over 29, almost 30 on the way there. And, and yes, so we have a little we have a pullback over the weekend because people always have have reasons for everything. Oh, you know, the you know, Iran and Israel didn't go to war. So, you know, we're going to, you know, so the world is, the world's, the world's a great place now or something. Well, the world's still, the world's a great place. I mean, think positive, but I mean, we, we haven't solved those problems. The Middle East is still there. Ukraine is still there. You know, Asia, Taiwan, it's all still there, you know, but it's time for people to take some money off the table. Same thing with gold. You know, there you are in, um, you know, February with that, you know, $2,000 gold, you know, and, and if somebody had said, oh yeah, boy, we're going to have 2,300 and 2300 and change gold you just said wow that's fabulous well we had 2400 dollars gold and now yeah we're back to you know 23 and change so uh you know we're, we're still doing well in a longer term sense the idea that it's going to you know drop back down oh it's going to go back to two thousand dollar gold or twenty dollar silver or whatever I, I i don't i don't see that happening i think this i think this move upwards in the last couple of months has been structural based on long-term macro issues you know, death of the dollar kind of issues. You know, it's not death of the dollar, at least, you know, the dollar has some terminal disease in it that's really starting to accelerate. You know, geopolitical stuff, you know, the, the movement from power moving from the West to the East, whatever, you know, uh, the war in Ukraine is lost. I mean, we, you know, we're, we're not going to get into that, but I mean, whatever Congress did over the weekend, oh, we're going to give Ukraine more money. That's okay. They're just going to spend more money before they lose the war to Russia. Well, they've already lost the war to Russia, but before people start to realize that it's, you know, fully lost, you know, there, there's nothing good geopolitically or monetarily or whatever that favors, you know, the dollar. And, and, and oh, by the way, here at home in America, the USA, I mean, the, you know, the fiscal budget, the Congress budget is just co totally, completely out of control, just deficits as far as the eye can see. And at 5% interest rates, the interest on the debt is huge. So all those macro reasons tell me that just enjoy the pullback. Today on my emails, I'm getting dozens, dozens, I mean, of emails from all these different gold sellers and gold companies that are, you know, I'm on their mailing list. Or, oh, this is a pullback. is a great opportunity to buy, buy some more silver, buy some more this and that. I would say right now platinum is actually kind of a bargain, you know, a, a you know, thousand bucks an ounce or so you can, you can get that. And then I'll just, we'll, we'll talk in a minute, but one thing I, I just want to tell you, a really good friend of mine, dear friend, I was talking about over the weekend and he, on Saturday morning, he went to his favorite coin shop. You know, he, he, the guy lives in New Jersey. He just went down the, he went down to his coin shop where he goes, you know, once a month, he's been going there for years, buying silver, gold, whatever. And he walks in there a Saturday morning. It's usually just, you know, dead. You walk in there with your coffee and you shoot the breeze with the guys behind the counter or whatever. You know, a couple of people walk in. Like, he said the place was a mob scene. And I said, well, what was going on? And he says, well, he said, he says, basically, there's two kinds of people. There's a whole lot of people with gold and silver in their hand trying to sell it because they want cash. They need cash. You know, they, they have to live. You know, they have to pay their bills. and They need the cash to sell their gold, their silver. And then there's another kind of person who walks in there with cash. 
or with a cashier's check or, you know, with a, with a credit card and certain approvals. And they're there to buy, you know, because they want they want to get rid of their cash. So it's a, uh, it, it tells you something a lot about, you know, the economy and the culture of America anymore. That, you know, the two kinds of people with you know, dealing with precious metals, those who want to sell it because they're broke and those who want to buy it because they don't trust the dollar anymore. That's my macro picture. So, uh, you know, with that, we can, we can move on to other things there. Well, Byron, it definitely is a uh, complicated picture, but a lot of macroeconomic factors backing the move into hard assets like gold and silver. And yeah, as a store of value, people can sell it when they need money or they can invest in it when they have money to store. So it serves that purpose in society. But when you look at the mining stocks, a little bit different kettle of fish. Now, while Mm -hmm. a lot of investors are bemoaning the fact that some of the juniors really haven't moved as much as they'd like, we were commenting off Mike that when you look at some of the big boys, something like an Agnico Eagle or a Kenross, or mm-hmm. you had named Harmony, there's a lot of mm-hmm. those companies and even a lot of the mid tiers that have actually had pretty big moves recently. So maybe paint the picture of where things are at, the bifurcation between the larger producers and the smaller explorers. Yes, absolutely. My goodness. I mean, when you look at the charts of some of these names, Harmony Gold, HMY, you know, South African play, it's mostly South Africa, you know, high geopolitical risk. All of the problems that you have in South Africa, electricity, water, you know, social problems, legal problems. But the, the, if you look at that company, holy smokes, it's had a had a fabulous run in the last, say, two and a half months. Wow, what a what a what a move up. You know, that's the difference between, you know, two thousand dollar gold and twenty three hundred dollar gold, that extra three hundred bucks an ounce. The, the gold has gone up faster than the cost of electricity or diesel or labor or concrete and steel and whatever. You know, for a company, so that's a company like Harmony. Uh, more closer to home, say, in uh, in, in uh, North America, look at a company like Hud Bay Minerals. Uh, Hud Bay, uh, you know, classic old, uh, classic old miner, copper, gold, silver, zinc, North American projects. Uh, I think they have one in, in Peru. You know, just a sturdy, well-run company. What a beautiful chart. Oh, my goodness. If you want up and to the right, take a look at Hud Bay. It's been a good couple of months, you know. And in terms of the big market, the big money in the market moving into mines and minerals and basic materials. No, people talk about early innings. I, I think we're barely out of the warm up pitching in the bullpen. The umpire hasn't even called play ball on uh, on this game for a lot of these uh, for a lot of these companies. And when you look at some of the almost doubles and, and even more that some of the uh, not not junior juniors, but some of the mid size mid tier guys have done, we are we are in a pretty you know, solid position right now and give the hard metals uh, play a little bit of time to, you know, to unfold. And uh, and some of these mid-tiers still have plenty of running room in front of them. Well, it seems to have been the mid-tiers that have more or less performed the best. The majors outside of base metals majors, the gold majors really have maybe just started moving after being pretty washed out. So, Byron, what do you look for in this environment where it has been the mid-tiers leading? Are, are you waiting for more money to come into the majors and them to start deploying money? Are you looking still at just the mid-tiers to deploy money? How does this process play out since it has been led by the mid-tiers? Okay, uh, here's, what, here's how we have to think about it. In term, what, does, what do the big market people want to see? You know, what are they looking for? They don't understand mining. They're not geologists. They're Wall Street traders. You know, they, they'll, they'll trade anything that looks like it'll trade. They don't care about gold. In fact, they learned in school that, you know, gold is terrible and, you know, it's, you know, gold is gold's a four letter word and all that kind of stuff. You know, so, so they don't really care. But what they do look for, what they do care about is earnings. And when you think about, you know, OK, well, what are the earnings of the gold mining companies? Well, it's April 22nd now. March 31st was just three weeks ago. A big whack of this rise in the gold price and silver price is very, very recent. And uh, it really doesn't matter what, you know, the people are selling their gold for right now. It doesn't pertain to all the gold that they sold in January and February, you know, before the March rise. That that, those numbers haven't filtered down to the bottom line. I here's I think we have to be a little more patient and look look three and four months out from now to, say, July when the second quarter of 2024, when the Q2 numbers come out from a lot of these companies, instead of selling, you know, $1,900 gold or 1950 or $2,000 gold, instead of selling that, they're going to have a couple of months of selling 22, 2250, 2300 gold. 
And some of those earning numbers are going to be blowouts. And when we uh, and, and when Wall Street sees those, that I think is going to start attracting, uh, you know, big money. I think some of the smart money, as opposed to big money, the smart money is already starting to quietly, quietly move in. And it gets back to what we said earlier that the move in gold and silver are these are not just sort of like temporary trading moves. These are moves that reflect structural issues of of price finding, price discovery, and of, you know, where is the economic power in the world? I mean, a country like India, for example, is buying silver hand over fist. I mean, what are they doing with it? Well, they, you know, they're, they're, they're out, they're building out their electronics industry. They're building out their other industries. Uh, they buy a lot of silver just to, you know, because the Indians like silver and whatever. So the same thing with gold. I mean, the last couple of months, it seems like the Shanghai gold exchange sets the price of gold at night on physical. And then in the morning, you know, morning and early afternoon, London and New York try to slam it down, but they they haven't been successful in slamming it back down. It gets to that. So th- this is this is a sticky price move, despite the weekend, you know, pullback in prices. I think I think we're going to, you know, when we talk in a month or you know, four or five weeks from now, when we talk again, uh, you know, you can, you know, hold me to account. You know, I'll, I'll, either, I'll either be right or wrong. I don't know. You know, but uh, I, I suspect that our prices today will hold up, if not, you know, be. Uh, you know, firming up, drifting up uh, over time. Again, it filters back into, you know, what does it take for the big guys to move? Well, they have to show big earnings to Wall Street, and then the money starts to flow. How about the intermediates? Well, they've already started to benefit from people, you know, realizing that that they're going to they're going to do well. But that's only that's only some of the early smart money moving in. Some of these some of these moves that we see, we've seen in places like HUD Bay or Harmony, Kinross, whatever. That's the early smart money moving in. That's not that's not the that's not just sort of like the Wall Street waterfall, uh, you know, coming in, you know, flooding the streets with, uh, you know, with with money. With, oh, geez, we have to deploy our money into into mines and minerals right now. We, that's not happening. That's not happening yet. Even, you know, no matter what the charts show in terms of price prices going up for their share prices. Well, Byron, with the margins improving for the producers, whether they be the majors, the mid-tiers, or even the smaller producers, we have noticed an uptick in some M&A, but most of it's coming from the mid-tiers going after either single asset producers or development projects. We've seen a half dozen transactions just over the last couple months, but we haven't seen some of those big wow-sized M&A deals. Do you think with the equities going up and on the producers, but not so much on the juniors, that it gives them the arbitrage to start being more aggressive and accretive transactions, looking at more M&A deals? Oh, man, that, what a great question. You're really opening a lot of doors on that one. First of all, to do M&A, you need some money, you know, and, and a lot, most people don't have just cash laying around. So the M&A, you know, the, the currency of M&A is share price. So if your share price is in the dirt, you can't afford in any sense of the word to do much M&A. When your share price starts to move, now you can think harder about doing an M&A. When you say, oh, these companies, they're buying, you know, this, the smaller outfits, the, you know, the advanced developers or the or very early stage ex- producers, or maybe even a late stage explorer. When you start to see things like that, that that's, that's really telling because it tells you that management teams, what it, what it says about management teams is that they think, these numbers, these current price levels are going to, are going to be sticky, that they're going to hold up more or less, you know, that they're not going to get the rug pulled out from under them and be embarrassed in, you know, next, next year when somebody says, why did you buy that company at such a high valuation? You know, you, uh, you, if you, if you waited another six months or another year, you could have bought it half what you paid. Well, that's, that's been the story for the last five or six years. You know, I mean, we, it was in, we were just in the doldrums. Oh man, we've had these discussions before, haven't we? You know, things were in the doldrums. Uh, nobody could afford in any sense of the word. They didn't have the money and they didn't have the uh, the board approval and they didn't have the shareholder backing really to go out on a limb and you know, start and start making these buys. Well, now we're starting to see it. And again, this is and I think this is the early part of of this is the early innings part of it where 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 the you know, the the, 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 the people who know that they need to grow things, they've had their eye on a project. They want to add some reserves. They want to add, they want to grow the resources, pick up some people, pick up some acreage in certain places, you know, move, you know, uh, you know uh, level out their, their risk profile, move from jurisdiction A to jurisdiction A and B or A, B and C, whatever, you know, we're starting to see that move. 
when you say that the big guys haven't made any big acquisitions, yeah, that's because big guys are so big and bureaucratic. It's very hard to get them to do things. I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not, I won't name any names, but I, you know, I, I can think of, of at least two and maybe three really big companies that I've dealt with household names, you know, three letter tickers, household name kind of companies that I've dealt with where when you talk with management about it, it's kind of like, you know, what about, what about M and a, what about buying? It's, oh, the board won't let us do this, or the board won't let us do that, or you know, oh, that we'll get murdered by the shareholders if we do something like that. It, it's so difficult to to get on the uh, to get on to get on the list of projects that that these guys can actually pull the trigger on and uh, and make it happen. Uh, it's very very bureaucratic at the upper levels, you know, it, and it it has all sorts of reasons to do with corporate governance. And you know, they, they work for Wall Street; they don't work for the normal shareholders not they, they don't work for the shareholders who might be listening to this broadcast with all respect to this broadcast but but you know who i mean that when they say that i work they work for wall street they don't work for you and me so to speak and so uh that that's that's their motivation because wall street's the people who can hire and fire them and they, they control their uh they control their bonuses and they control their their you know their career future and everything else so so you get a lot of you get a lot of hesitation at the top levels, but in these mid tiers where we're seeing the uh, acquisitions, this is early in the game, and I do think it's going to filter down as long as these gold silver prices, copper prices, you know, hold up, which I think they will for all sorts of structural reasons, monetary and structural political reasons. We will see more uh, M and A, uh, and it's really just a question of you know what are you know good companies with good projects out there that are. That are that are that are hanging in there, you know, that are, that, that are uh, attractive to to the takeovers. Yeah, it does seem early stage here, Byron, and I think that's also because we just went through a pretty ruthless bear market, a multi-year bear market for all of the stocks and these majors. Uh, we've heard it before; they are big, right? So they need big deals to move the needle, and that's why I think we've started to see some of the majors, the precious metals majors, look to some of the other commodities like copper, which are large markets and could offer some of that leverage. But again, all eyes being on these mid tiers who are performing well. And for everyone invested in the juniors, which I know we all are in some way, just waiting for some of that money to come down. But some of these juniors have also shown some life too. So Again, a correction like we're seeing today, while it can look like a big number on a screen just for today, you look at any chart and you can just see how uh, little the pullback is right now. The question is just how much further will it pull back because it did need a, a natural correction here to reset some of that overbought sentiment, but overbought's good. That means bull markets. Byron, thank you very much for your time. We'll chat again probably next month. We'll dive into a little bit more of what's happening in the sector and a couple more stocks. So, Byron, thank you. I hope you have a great rest of your week. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you to all the listeners out there. Good luck to everybody.